working on the video. In this trek, we talked about service and we're joined by Dr. Jennifer Blaylock. We talked about questions like, why are some service roles glorified and others undervalued? And when is the time you have been the recipient of service? This conversation went places I definitely did not expect, so get ready for some amazing insights. And without further ado, here is the trek. Starting route 43. Hello everyone and welcome to The Trek. The Trek is a Civics Unplugged series where community members participate in meaningful discussions on topics that are too often neglected when thinking about building the future. Through prompting questions and provocations, we venture together into complex but important conversations related to building the future and democracy. We understand that this work requires ongoing dialogue, but it's a journey worth trekking through. I'm Madison, I'm a high school senior from Vertigris, Oklahoma, joined by some of our community members and a special guest, which you will hear from in just a moment. And tonight we're talking about service and we start off with a word association. So once you see your name on the screen, give a brief introduction and the one to three words you associate with the topic and why. Cough, cough, Leora, cough, cough. Sorry, okay, I will go ahead. Um, when I think of service. Wait, who are you? Who are you? Oh, you're so right. Um, hi, I'm Leora. I am a high school senior from the Boston area. Um, first words that come to mind when I think of service is um, doing good. Um, and telephone. Um, I'm happy to go next. Hello, my name is Chawu Kapumba. I am 19 and a proud builder of this community. And when I think of service, I think of over or undervalued um, just because I feel like positions of service like Play, being playing a role in government we like overvalue those people um and then we also undervalue really key positions of service like teachers and firefighters um and so those are my two words when it comes to service hello um my name is mariam i am a high school senior from the suburbs of chicago and my three words are helping other people super basic but just what immediately comes to mind for the definition of service hi um my name is nuid i'm also a high school senior i'm also from the suburbs of chicago um and my three words are outside of yourself Hi everyone, I'm Zoe. I am 17 and from, or in the Charlottesville, Virginia area. Um, the th three words I came up with was just quality versus quantity. I think that especially like in high school with clubs, there's a huge emphasis on doing a lot of community service and it's not always the most meaningful kind of service. And like what Chabu said, we don't always value, I think some of the highest quality forms of service. Hey y'all, I'm Max. I'm 16 and a high school sophomore uh, from Maine. And uh, my word association would be uh, contribution. Um, I definitely agree with everything that's been said prior, um, but I think ultimately the service is just about giving your time and your energy to something uh, bigger than yourself. Hi, my name is Berillian. Um, I'm a high school junior from um, the greater Lansing area in Michigan. Um, and the a word that I associate with service is passion. Um, because if you're spending a lot of time doing something, you want to enjoy doing it. Jennifer, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and then say your words. Hey, everybody. I am Jennifer, and I'm joining you from Jacksonville, Florida. And my two words, it's really one word hyphenated, is life-changing. I feel like when you serve others and you live a life of service, it changes not only others' lives, but yours as well. 
Hey everyone, I'm Gary calling in from New York City. Um, my word is probably love because, yeah, I think service, there, there's, a, there's a rational component to serving others, as in like, you know, the idea is that we're all connected, but, um, you know, in the, in the immediate term, it's, it's really like out of love that you do things for others without kind of worrying about how it comes back to you. Yeah, and for me, the word that came to mind was objectives, just because the dis like what distinguishes when someone's serving for others, and I guess when they're self-serving, is their ultimate objectives of what they're doing and how that, that motivates them. But yeah, thank you all for sharing. Uh, we can go ahead and hop into the conversation. So does anyone have a question or provocation to get us started off with? Okay, the Chabu's uh, word association kind of made me wonder like, why are some service roles glorified and others like undervalued? Um, I'd be happy to kind of get us started on this question. I think what comes to mind is the idea that some of the most impact, well, there are service roles that are really impactful, but aren't impactful on a wider scale. So they, they're more impactful for like individuals or small communities. Um, and those are the ones that are undervalued, even though like investing in smaller communities has probably one of the greatest impacts on a wider scale. And so just thinking about the idea of like teachers um, who have been like, teachers have been like heroes in my life um, for as long as I can remember. And they're not necessarily valued, but the impact that they have in individuals is astronomical. Um, so I think it has a lot to do with just like the scale of the impact or quantity playing a role in that. Or honestly, um, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say to second that, I think especially in the example of teachers where like, um, I was talking to my mom today and she's an educator and she was saying how like, if she didn't have kids or if she probably wasn't an educator, she wouldn't, it wouldn't be her main concern that like COVID is making kids go online for school. Um, so I think something can hold less value to someone if it's not necessarily directly impacting them. And I think like education is spe specifically now um, is one of the ways that like you can see, like if it directly impacts you, it's, it's not glorified, but it's definitely paid more attention to um, than other people who might undervalue it. I'd add that just speaking of attention, um, it's a lot easier to see, you know, like Chabu said, things on a larger scale versus things on a smaller scale. Um, you know, even if you look at um, like news sources, right, we all, at least most of us are guilty of, you know, paying attention to national news. And at least for me personally, I could tell you a lot more about what's going on in the United States and the world as a whole compared to what's going on in my home state of Maine. Um, so I think we're all guilty of, of just devoting less of our, of our attention and energy to the things that are happening um, like right around us. Yeah, into that, into Chabu's point about like some service roles, like having like different, like politicians, for example, like having a bigger impact. I, I think a lot of it is just like more perceived impact. Like I can't think of a politician that has like changed my life. But if we use a teacher example, um, I, I, I've had several teachers that change, like that have affected what I do on a day-to-day -day basis and how I see the entire world. Uh, so it, it's pretty crazy to me how it's like, um, yeah, how it, it's kind of flipped on how we should value the service more. Um, I also think that people focus on um, things that like fit their agendas. So like politicians and um, just big figures, um, like they profit a lot and teachers. Um, I mean, they, if you're in a 
a very resourceful community, they are probably more um, paid attention to than if they were in a smaller community or like a, a, a less resourced community. Um, so I think that's part of it too. And I think really you raised a really good point um, just about like the power dynamics of it all, I guess, that I know that in many ways, we, we certainly do not fund our education systems enough. So I feel like in a lot of areas, teachers were seen as adversarial where they're asking for more resources and people are like, we can't give it to you while there are other professions that are just paid more just because of the way that those systems are set up. And so we just have such a clear connection between like how much money you're making that we undervalue teachers, even though really teachers being underpaid is our fault. It's not theirs. Um, yeah, and I feel like I, people have been getting at this, but it is like the thing with politicians versus like teachers. It's like, I, I, I don't know if it's a particularly American thing to kind of like, um, I, I don't know if there's a verb to like make someone a celebrity, but do that to our politicians and make them these like big heroic type of figures. I don't know if that's a uniquely American phenomenon. I feel like in some other countries, that's not how politicians are seen, but they are here. Um, and so like our educators and anybody who's in service doesn't get that same type of celebrity treatment. And I wonder why it is that that's the way it's become an American society. I think that's a really good point because I, what you're really getting at is how do we measure value, right? Like we've talked about informal service and then more formal or normalized or socialized definitions of what service is. So how do we value it would be my question. And how do we measure the impact? I think that's a great point. Um, and like even kind of tying into like what people were talking about earlier, a reason why some people might like under and overvalue, like for example, like I feel like a lot of people might not complain about like firefighters and like them asking for more funding because they could eventually use them in the future or like they might have a need for them. So it's like if something has some sort of like intrinsic value to you because you could get something out of it, then they're like more likely to be like, oh yeah, for sure, like we'll support them and help them. But then back to like what Nora was saying about like teachers and if it's not directly impacting you or like your kids or something like that, it's a lot harder to convince people that there is a value there. Um, I guess just like human nature, if things don't really impact yourself, it's like harder to like get yourself to care about like what other people um, are doing, but I guess empathy plays a big role in that too. I also think that it's like very hard to measure and quantify the certain types of impact, um, especially if it's like, if there's like long-term benefits that you may never understand or see as like what might have started that. I keep using the example of a teacher, um, but like there's no, like my fifth grade teacher is probably the most influential teacher I've ever had, but the implications of like, you can't measure her impact um, all the way through to like me being 19 now. Um, but there has been like a lot of impact. So I think that it's easier to kind of measure some over others. Um, and that's why it makes it, a, it makes it easier to value other types of service. I'd like to say that um, the best way of measuring the impact of any specific service would be um, the individual's health. That is, you know, the individual that is being served. Um, you know, I mean, if, if it's a teacher, that's not going to be as easy to see, right? Because, you know, teachers certainly would have, you know, indirect impacts on health because, you know, maybe they help a person um, learn the skills to find a job, financially support themselves, or discover the thing that they're really passionate about and develop their feeling of fulfillment and, and heighten their mental health. Um, and then, you know, of course, there are some other things like doctors, of course, that have a completely direct impact, but I feel like, I don't know, health, health seems like a big one. I feel like that's, 
I, I personally tend to view health as like one of the most important things. Um, so that's just the way I connect the two. I like that you brought that up. So you talked about health. So let's kind of think about like what's going on right now, right? Like vaccinate, you know, mass vaccination and community health and service and essential workers, right? So we've talked about teachers. How does something like community health impact service? Like what level does our federal versus our state, local, like we talked a little bit about that already, but what are kind of y'all's thoughts about that in terms of um, service? and the world, you know, the science that we're living through right now. Um, I actually think this kind of ties in with the whole agenda idea because um, people will, I mean, there's, I guess in this day and age, there's two sides where there's people who prioritize health and then there's people who prioritize profit. Um, and so it's hard to find like a, balance of those things because sometimes you do have to sacrifice parts of it um but yeah i i don't think that actually answered the question but it, it is like a point that <laughs> um could be brought up um this definitely reminds me of the idea of like you need to be healthy and like you need to take care of yourself first um before you can serve other people but i think that that is something that is the truth and super important to prioritize, but there are also like communities that need to serve each other that aren't in a place of health. Um, and that's a really difficult situation to be in as well. But it just kind of speaks to the fact that like whoever is serving others needs to kind of be in a place where they're able to do that. And I think also, I think, I think many of us are maybe more acutely aware of this, just like with the effects of the pandemic, that in many ways, communities, like smaller units of people are the most impactful and are normally the best equipped to affect the change that's needed in a certain area. Like while yes, the federal government and I'll even scale bigger, the United Nations has all of these, you know, these resources and this wealth, but there's just so much bureaucracy, so much process that it would take so long for any of that help I guess, to get to the areas that need it. And then by the time it gets there, it's not, it's not what you need because um, they're not able to get to the really granular level where we need that support, um, which I think is kind of an unfortunate side of how I think we teach kids about service that we emphasize like big impact of like touch as many people as you can around the world, but you can touch a lot of people and not go that deep. You know, like you could share this really great Instagram post and people read it, but you're not like helping the people who really need it in your community necessarily. Um, and so I think community health is just so important and that's where you go so much deeper. And I think that's where you can really touch people. And that's a place where I think teachers play in, um, people working in grocery stores. You wouldn't think that those people have a lot of impact, but if there weren't people working in your grocery store, you wouldn't get food. Like that's a huge aspect of community health as well. Yeah, and like, just on the point of you're saying like um, quality is, is like, we shouldn't do quantity over quality. I was thinking about this in respect to the previous question that I think when I think about like who I really admire, who does service, like who I really admire, it's always at like some personal cost to themselves. Um, and obviously like we're not all altruistic and it's just impossible to do that. But the best, the most meaningful service to me has always been when it comes at some cost to the person or they, they have to go out of their way in some way to, to do what they're doing. Um, and that's something I, I really admire. So it's always that, that quality, even if it's little things, if it's something they go out of their way to do, it makes all the difference. Are we all called to service to your point? Like, do we all have a responsibility to serve? I think to an extent there's that responsibility to serve yourself in the sense where like, um, when, when Leora was just talking, she kind of reminded me of how like, um, the love language of like acts of service, like whether that's like, I don't know, like dropping off coffee to a friend or like finding a way to like 
do something small, but again, it would be out of your way, but like, you don't necessarily feel that pressure because it's something you want to do. I think that there's like a responsibility to serve yourself in the sense, um, that like, I, like, I'm a firm believer in the, in the fact that like, if you can't help yourself, you can't help other people. Um, and so if your ultimate end goal is to like help other people, I think helping yourself is doing yourself the service of being able to like, make sure you're intact so that when you're called upon either to serve other people or you want to serve other people, that's something that you can do in full. Yeah. And I think to this question, the idea that not everyone is called to service is like very like dangerous. So like, it's just like a very like negative narrative. I, I mean, I know that's like kind of what's pushed like in the high school leadership idea. It's like, oh, you have to be a certain personality type in order to have like leadership roles or to like do whatever. And then like, when you just realize like how stupid that sounds, like <laughs> once I realized that I was like, wow, the idea that only certain kinds of people can be in like leadership or service roles. And so I think that's kind of the idea that people have now. Um, and I just think that that's very dangerous because obviously service doesn't have to look the same for everyone, but whether it be like taking care of yourself so you can take care of others or like playing a service role, like, like being a, a parent is in, in ways a service role, like being a, like a good brother or sister. Um, like th there's ways that we can all serve and, and make an impact on the people around us. I think I definitely add that when people don't serve, that's when communities suffer. Um, you know, because we all, you know, something that something that CU has emphasized is fine. A U shaped hole. That's something that really, you know, stuck with me from the fellowship. And, you know, everybody has one and everything, everybody has something that they can contribute. And yeah, I feel like, you know, to answer the question, yes, we are all called to service because we all have something to to do for other people. I definitely agree with Noor in, you know, in the sense that we have to take care of ourselves first. But as soon as that's done, I I don't think it's enough to just like say I'm done. Um because there's you know there's always more to do. And that, you know, that can, of course, be a dangerous mindset, but um, to some extent, it's a healthy one. Yeah, I, I think personally, I'm kind of a believer that, you know, when people help do something for other people, whether it's like making them laugh or, or something more, I don't want to say significant because laughter is significant, um, but something more in depth, um, it makes you happy. Um, at, at least for me, like when I make someone laugh, it's like, it, it makes my day so much better. Um, so I feel like in going back to what Nora said, it all ties into it. It's like, you can't, like, if you don't love yourself, it's so hard to love others and be there for others. So it all ties into that. And I think we have kind of an innate call to service to ourselves and maybe gets lost a lot of the time that in turn turns into that love for others um, and serving others. I was quoting RuPaul, Chavu. <laughs> That's awesome. How do you guys get inspired to serve? Like, what motivates you to do it? I think that, like, from a personal perspective, anything that motivates me to, everything that motivates me to serve, um, is probably a byproduct of like a lived experience um and just realizing that there have been circumstances where like I've been served and it's not like transactional and so it just encourages like I, it just encourages the act of doing something with like not anticipating getting anything in return um and it's also very gratifying a few years ago um one of my English classes we had this like school year long debate about like the idea of whether service like all service is um actually selfish because you kind of get some kind of gratification out of it and so I think that all motivations are very much intrinsic and come from a personal perspective and so what motivates you is personal and there is something that you get out of that experience because it is so gratifying 
I think that sometimes the best moments where like you you serve are the moments where like you don't realize that you're doing it where like it takes a minute of reflection afterwards to be like oh this was like something that has this effect on someone else when in reality it was just kind of how Chabu said like it's not transactional because it's just part part of me wants to say it's part of the vibe but like more specifically like it's part of a relationship or it's part of um like a morning routine like serving yourself in that sense um and so I think like it's it gets to a point where like sometimes it feels only natural like it's the only it like it's the only actual next next step or next move For me, motivation to serve comes from sympathy and empathy. Um, you know, of course, if I can't put myself in somebody's shoes, um, like Chabu said, if I can't, so that's that's not a good way of putting it. If I can't directly empathize with their experience, I can try to imagine that. How, you know, how would I feel if I was in this situation? Look at, you know, look at how much... Um, how intense the emotions are that this person is experiencing being able to you know just take the time to like recognize that whether it's through interviews documentaries music just culture in general um and then reflect on it tends to at least for me say i want to do something about this i think uh where it where the, the disconnect tends to be how much effort am I really willing to put into this, even if I do care? Yeah, and I, I, I definitely agree with all of those. And I think for me as well, it's like when there's a recognition that something needs to be done and I have the capacity to do it, um, that just applies to so many different scales, be it for like a friend, uh, if I'm like if a friend is needing something and I have the capacity to do it or um, like something in my school or even like with the work that we're doing at CU, it's like something needs to be done. Who else is gonna do it? Like I have the capacity to, and that's a lot of what motivates me. I'll say too that I think having people around you who are motivated to serve is really important. Um, and I know that we've talked about like teachers and stuff. And I think that for many, for many people, like school is where they kind of get their call in some way, if it's not coming from like they're like where they're growing up or you know the community around them. Um, and so like seeing other people serve and like having that happen to you where like someone's helping you, I think is a big part of it. Um, and this is kind of like a, a loop de loop tie back to like, is everyone called to serve? Um, I think that if people have never been served before, it's really hard for them to start serving. Um, and so in some ways, it is the responsibility of people who can be conscious of it to serve others because that helps more people want to serve other people as well. Because um, I think there are people who do get really isolated and it, it's not in their best interest, like it really isn't. Um, until someone can kind of show them that, that grace and that love by serving them in some way. That is such a great point because I was going to ask you all like in a leadership role, oftentimes that ability to be vulnerable and transparent to actually be the recipient of service is a space that makes us uncomfortable. And so I wanted to talk or ask you all to share if you've had experiences where it was a challenge or where you were the recipient of service versus being the person serving and what that was like. I would love to hear your answer to that question. Um, I love the questions, but I just, I don't know. I feel like you'd have something really interesting to say. Sure. So um, I grew up in a single parent household. My mom had an eighth grade education. And um, so we were on public assistance and we lived in section eight housing and I very, like, I have a lot of vivid memories. I, um, we grew up in a really cold climate and I used to have to take the city bus. Like, even when I was like a baby, my mom had to like ride the bus and just like some of those transformational periods of people remembering or helping, like we always, when we finally got a car, it would always break down and people would help us. And so when I see people like 
pouring down rain. Like I want to pick them up. Do you know what I mean? Like I have that sense of I've been there and you were talking about it, like empathy and sympathy, you know? And so I have a very deep heart for service because I know that people invested in me and I feel that depth of obligation, but I am terrible now at 47 years old at accepting help. Like I'm so bad at it. You guys, I'm terrible at it. I would much rather, I don't want to receive presents. I want to give presents. So that's something I work on. And that's why I thought I wanted to get your all the feedback from you all to kind of help me because I need work there, Max. I need work. <laughs> Thank you for that. It really took me a while to think of it, but I actually thought of one, um, funny enough, related to a teacher. Um, where for our like eighth grade graduation, like somebody was going to get to give a speech at our like eighth grade promotion and people had to try out to do it. Uh, and so I had written a speech, uh, but like I had a geometry test that like didn't go great. And I was like, oh, but all these other people are trying out. I don't want to do it. So I was like walking to lunch, like I had like, like, you know, 15 minutes before, like the last time you could try out to speak, I was just going to go to lunch. Um, and my English teacher, um, bless his heart, Mr. Peebler, like yells from the other side of the hallway. He was like, Zoe, get in here and give that speech. And I was like, what? And he was like, you're not going to lunch. He's like, you're coming in here and you're going to give it. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, and so that was, that was a good experience. And afterwards, um, just had a really great, I think like heart to heart. And he was like, I know that you were like nervous, but he was like, you need to do this. He was like, I knew that your speech was going to be good. So he was like, you would have been doing everyone a disservice if you didn't do that. Um, so that was a really great, I think, case study of that where I'll, I mean, I would not have, I would not have tried out. I would have just kept going on my day. Um, and it was when he like sashayed out of the room, like snapped and all of that and was like, get in here. Um, a really, yeah, really great experience for sure. Um, when I was, um, when I like, when we used to go to school in person, um, my school is close enough for like, if I wanted to walk, I could. Um, and so sometimes where I was like up early in the morning, I would, um, like get ready to go. And there was always a Starbucks on the way. And like, I love coffee. And so every time I would stop by and that was like, it was a thing. Um, but every time I walked, it was like a tiny bit out of the way. And so moral of the story is like walking to Starbucks and then going to school took longer than just going straight to school. Um, but I did it every time. And a friend of mine, um, would always send me like a gift card or like, like, like Starbucks, like points to like go and like, buy a drink for free for that like day or week that I decided to walk if like the conditions permitted it. Um, and so it was always something that like stuck with me. Cause it was like, it was never asked for. It wasn't like it was a necessity. It was literally just like a thing that they did out of the kindness of their heart. Um, and so it's kind of something that like now I try to like replicate with like either my friends, especially cause like, um, a lot of them don't live close by or like if they do, we're in COVID. So I can't exactly stop by. Um, but that's kind of one of the, like the repetitive things that comes to mind. Nor just made me, I, I was thinking of like more emotional things at, at different points in my life, but I, Nor's made me think of, of, um, a few summers ago, I was, um, volunteering at, um, this, I was volunteering for Boston Harbor Islands, which is like a, a state park in Boston. Um, and I volunteered in like the visitor booth downtown and, and it's on this place called the Greenway, which is like a very touristy area. Um, so mostly what I did was instead of telling people to go to the islands, I just directed tourists um, where to go and like the nearest public bathrooms and all that. So I met a lot of cool people and it was a lot of fun. Um, but I would stand there like in the sun for hours because there was like no AC in this booth and I would just stand there and uh, right across from me was this like two food trucks like without fail these two food trucks and one of them was like it's called like cookie monster and it's basically just like two cookies and just like ice cream in the middle and it's kind of like a boston staple and i would just stand there for hours staring at 
at the Cookie Monster food truck, like dying to like, oh God, like I wish I could just get some of that. So one time I finally, like after my shift was over, I went over and I was like, I have to get some. And she was like, do you volunteer, the person in the food truck was like, do you like volunteer over there? Cause I was wearing my polo shirt. And I was like, yeah, I do. And she just gave me like a free sand, like Cookie Monster sandwich. And I was just so grateful. It like, I just, I can't even explain the joy <laughs> of, of that moment so thank you for reminding me of that because I just yeah that was I was that made me feel very nice <laughs> you just brought up something that is a word that I've been thinking about and that's gratitude right like how many of you have ever had someone tell you or share with you that you did something that they were grateful for something you did for them like isn't that just the best experience like I had a young lady come up to me at a conference that I didn't even remember her. I felt so badly. And she was like, you believed in me um, because I've mostly worked in colleges and stuff. And she's like, you told me I'd be great with students and I'm in working at this college now. And I just wanted to say thank you for that. And that's like the mark of my career after 20 years. Like those are the things that matter. You know, people telling me that me just listening to them sometimes made a difference. Yeah, I think that is a great uh, note to end on before we hop into reflection. I'm going to go ahead and send the notes in the chat for you all to look over and I can get us started. Um, so a couple of things. Um, normally, like my go to icebreaker, I'm sure some of you know, is like, what has been the highlight of your day? But I absolutely love this question. Like, when is a time that you have been served? Uh, I just loved hearing your all story. So I'm going to steal this and use it in different spaces as well. Also, I really like the role that you play, Jennifer. I, I loved hearing from you as well, but just like all the questions that you pose were really thought provoking. Um, and so I really appreciated that as well. Well, thank you all. I really have enjoyed it. One of the things um, I'm thinking back to is um, when Zoe had talked about how um, having people around you that are motivated to serve um, or like consciously doing so makes it easier for you to serve. Um, and it just, it reminds me of all the little things that like people, people did as like an act of service that like you kind of take and like translate and either like do the same thing or like put your spit on it. Um, and so it's also nice to think, I don't know if this goes back to Chavi's point of like, is this inherently selfish but it's nice to think that like there could be a moment where like I did something and someone was like this was an act of service like I could draw from um and then put their own spin on it so it's cool to see how full circle that comes that was a great question I don't know it's hard it's hard to say what what oneself did that could have changed someone's life I think a lot of you have shared stories of what people have done that have changed your lives. And I would encourage you to keep that dialogue going, right? Like in times like this, I don't know about you guys, but I know a lot of you have talked about sort of that isolation. Like, I think it was Nora that was saying like, you would love to just like go see your friends. And obviously like now you can't like, even just so like, I love you or I miss you, or I loved when we had, you know, we did this that one time and someone's like, really, I don't even remember that. You know what I mean? So just expressing that is it is a service to other people and people really need that to know that they were important and they made a difference. Um, yeah, I really liked uh, everyone's emphasis on like small acts of service because I feel like those can go such a long way, just like everyone has said. Um, and also like the emphasis on teachers being so impactful because I totally agree. I think teachers are way undervalued and they have had some of the most impactful, um, yeah, just more, the most impact on me. Um, so yeah, that was really nice to hear about. Definitely. I think one of like the things that I wanna take away from like this conversation is like random acts of kindness. Cause I feel like um, in like certain situations, it's like, oh yeah, like it's your birthday, like I'll do something nice or like I'll go out of my way. But like, I feel like for me, it's like the random things that like make me feel like the most happy because it's like someone's thinking about you and just like popping in to say like, oh, I like, I really miss you. Or, like, I like talking to you or like, 
a random act of service is like it hits different because you know like you just know that people are like thinking about you and just also along those lines like random expressions of gratitude just like when it's on your mind I think that that's something that I've been trying to be more intentional about is like if it's on my mind just like say it and be like hey I really love that like thank you for doing that um and just being more like willing to express it and like starting to foster that culture because I think it's not everywhere but like it starts with us so definitely something that I want to continue doing in my own life too. Yeah, I'm definitely thinking a lot about, sorry, Zoe, uh, thinking a lot about um, gratitude. Um, I, for, it just reminds me like the last, the last month in class, we, we did a gratitude journal in one of my classes, um, like each day consistently. Um, and it was something I I'd never tried before. Um, and it was, it was really fun. Like it was like a really nice part of my day. Um, and so just thinking about how much seeing like the little things that often go unnoticed, whether it is like things that people do for other people, things that I can do for others, makes me happier and a more grateful person. I was gonna say something I realized while you were talking, Laura, is that in many ways in our conversation that gratitude is an act of service. Like a lot of people do a lot of great work that goes unthanked. Um, so just telling someone that you're really grateful for what they did is an act of service because that helps that person go um, even further. But I'll say also like ditto on what Madison, what you were saying that I am using this icebreaker every chance that I get. Um, just had so many like warm fuzzies, like hearing everyone talk about their stories. And it was just really, really lovely and would really like to kind of spread that, I guess, to other spaces as well. I think that like this is such an incredible conversation to have just like reflecting on not only the ways that we can serve others but how we've been served I think it's so informative of like the moments that were the most memorable it feels like a reminder like all the memorable moments were really small and didn't take a lot of effort um or weren't like you know super dramatic and so I think that it's just a reminder that there's so many opportunities in day-to-day -day moments um, to give someone that memorable act of service. So I really appreciated this conversation. It was an important reminder. I just, you know, adding on to what everybody has already said, um, I think my biggest takeaway is that is, is the importance of um, service within a small community, just given, you know, given the amount of attention we pay to people who serve on a large scale compared to those who serve you know, in our, in our schools and in our towns and in our cities. Um, I'm, I'm guilty of, of paying more attention, you know, to the people in the bigger picture when really those who are, you know, those who are helping those around me um, tend to be, tend to live pretty close in comparison. Thank you all so much for sharing. Uh, Jennifer, before we do the group photo, I want to hear from you and Berlian, uh, since it was your first trek, uh, what were your thoughts on the trek overall? Do you want me to go first? Sure, go for it. Awesome. I had a wonderful time on this trek and this journey. I think that service is something that's been a huge part of my life. I actually, um, I did a year of service, a year and a half. I went to the Olympics. I served uh, this is the first time I was ever on an airplane. I left my city and and uh, just you know did a year of community service. And I'd like to do the Peace Corps. Um, that's like next on my list. So, but I also try to live a servant leader's life. And you guys just inspired me. I love the conversation and the 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 authenticity of everyone's um, you know thoughts. So thank you. I thought it was great. I love the format. Um, yeah, I feel the same way. I thought this was a really great um, experience and I loved hearing what everyone had to say, um, especially because it came from everyone own, everyone's own experiences, um, which is always interesting. So I appreciated that. Yeah, it would be great to have you all back in the future. You're more than welcome. Okay, so now everyone, I'm going to give us a countdown so we can do a group picture. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. Love the guitar, Max. <laughs> first, 
Trek number 50 and first ever group photo making history. Uh, thank you all so much for coming and I will see you again in the future. Bye. Bye. Of humanity with a bunch of different tribes like underneath it that just aren't warring with each other. Um, like I, I think sports are, are a great example of how humans who are alike in a lot of different ways can be in tribes and mostly not be negative towards each other unless you're like a Yankees fan and you throw like sodas at people for fun. But um, I, I think that if we can get rid of the, the negative causes of why people in tribes war with each other, I think we can move forward towards that solidified uh, vision of humanity. Um, so before I forget, just because this keeps coming up with like tribes and competition and rules, what I think what this conversation has, has revealed to me is that competition could be a lot healthier, like competition tends to be pretty healthy if the people that are competing agree to the same set of rules. And I think our current state of politics in America people don't, it's just like at, at, at all costs, right? Do, do whatever at all costs. Um, and, and, and there's also no boundaries of our politics now, right? It kind of, it, it's sort of seeped into every part of our, our lives. And um, I think a big concern of all sorts of people is like that, that the one thing that was sacred that wasn't infected by this, this like zero sum war, um, is 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 going to be tainted by the way our politics works. So, um, and I, and, I, and I think when people talk about our economy with like, you know, business business concentration of power, often people are talking about like how small businesses in in giant corporations they play by different rules. So, um, really thought I thought this was really thought provoking on that note about games and rules. I really, really enjoyed this track. And I think that it also kind of brings up the important conversation of like, there are things that are within human nature that are more likely to like, um, almost like result in bad things or make us more susceptible to creating new challenges. And so just the idea of like kind of reconciling with those characteristics and like being aware of them. I feel like this conversation on tribalism really did that. Um, and then also kind of made me think of like, what are the inherent reoccurring themes in humanity and how can we not ignore them or pretend like they don't exist, but kind of address them actively. So thank you for the conversation. I'm also uh, thinking about a lot. Uh, just a thought that I'm thinking about at this moment is like the spectrum, family, tribe, village, city, nation, community, movement, right? Like, and what would it be like, maybe tribalism could be healthier if you always situate it in that spectrum, right? Because I think a lot of like the danger is when the tribe becomes everything, my tribe versus your tribe. But if you can say like, yeah, I've got my tribe and I'm proud of my tribe and my tribe is great, but it's situated within humanity. Or the other way, like I've got my tribe, my tribe is great, but like I've also got my family and that's even more important, right? So like kind of trying to put it along the spectrum. I'm leaving oh. feeling like, oh, go for it, Sam. Okay, sorry. Um, I was just gonna say, I love what you were saying. Um, and I guess the takeaway for me based off of mostly that actually is maybe instead of trying to like be a part of tribes, be a part of like, I don't know, mini communities. And, you know, if we want like a healthy competition then we can add tribal aspects to it without actually making it a tribe where there's maybe too much competition. So like for a sports team, you can be a community hanging out outside of the court or the field or whatever, but then still be able to be competitive but still respectful. So like balancing community with aspects of tribalism, I guess. Yeah, I would say my reflection on this is like the, a lot of the thing, one of the main things that like leads into the, I guess not competitive nature where you get from like the competitive nature, kind of like what um, 
Gary was saying, where you get from the competitive nature to like the no rules, um, like zero sum games is like when you lose respect, like for the other side. And so I think just, oh. and that's what you're saying about like everyone being equal to like, just trying to ensure that like everyone respects each other. I think that's, that's a part of how you kind of eliminate some of the competition. I'm leaving kind of uh, realizing I need to do a lot more reflecting on what the word tribe means to me. Um, and, you know, one of the things I'm curious to reflect on is whether um, tribes are, are kind of value neutral and can be used for good or bad, or if they are inherently good or bad. Um, and I think regardless, one of the questions for me in thinking about um, the, the structures of the future um, is, uh, you know, are, are there any good aspects to them that we'd want to carry forward uh, to not throw the, the baby out with the proverbial bathwater? Um, one of the things that always fires me up is, is how we create structures that allow people to come together to accomplish big things that, that they couldn't accomplish by themselves. Um, and I think that this has been a, a mechanism historically um, that, that has accomplished some good and accomplished some bad. Um, but as we think about ways to, to kind of create more structures for coming together to do more good than bad, um, what can we learn from, from history here? Yeah, thank you all so much for sharing. Um, just to kind of like close this off, Ari, Mackenzie, and Adam, I know this was your first trek, so would love to hear what you thought about the trek overall. Do you guys do this every week? This is awesome. We do it a couple times a week. Yeah, <laughs> this is number 49. <laughs> it's, you know, it's so great. Like, there's so few spaces like this to just like think big about ideas and not not in a tri not in a tribal context, not in like a we have to advance this particular objective just to reflect. And it's amazing. The whole world should be doing this. What's cool is that we're all part of very different tribes as well. To, to point to that. Um, one of my favorite things to participate in is called the Socrates program at Aspen, uh, the Aspen Institute, which is a think tank here in DC. Um, but they have these Socratic conversations on some of these timeless questions that, that happen over time. This feels a lot uh, like the, the spirit of that um, in that, um, you know, you all started with a word and then are, it just went from there and, and kind of are exploring all kinds of different angles. Um, but you know, I think inherently with this angle of uh, you know what what can we do to work towards a better future, um, and uh, you know it, it just gives me tremendous hope for the future, uh, and I'm just so grateful that that all of you are taking this on, um, and and I think it's really cool that you've invited uh, you know different guests to come and, and be guest members of your conversations because I think. Um, the, the echo chambers are so much a part of the problem. And so creating spaces for, you know, different people to, to jump in and, and participate is super cool. Um, you know, I, I think I do, uh, you know, the, the like the system thinker in me is like, well, how does this all come together at the end? Like, I want to fast forward and, and figure out like the, the great society that you all planned. Uh, but I know that, that the, the process is working, um, uh, but, but I'm, I'm really thrilled to follow along and see where it goes. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this, like what Mackenzie and Ari said, this is super cool. Um, and yeah, one of the problems like I've had is that like no one's going to communicate about like issues really. And so this just being a room where people can like communicate about issues and kind of like try and like trek through them together is super cool and like a really, really awesome thing. What is points for Adam? Yeah, for using the trek language. Love that. Uh, well, Thank you all for coming. It was a great conversation. I, I've been gone for the past week and a half, so this was very refreshing for me, um, jumping into another trek. But yeah, you all are welcome to come to another one, of course, uh, whenever you want. Just, just let Gary know. Um, and thank you all for your time. I'll see you later. Bye. Bye.